Hello everyone, welcome back to GGN. This is part three for this news report today. And I'm just going to continue with uh, where we left off, Iraq and Kurdistan's little standoff that uh, kind of went under the radar. But it says here that a specialist from the Center for Energy Security Studies at uh, USAK discussed the reasons and context of the escalation, stating that Prime Minister uh, Maliki is trying to expand Baghdad's sovereignty at the expense of Kurdish autonomy for two main reasons. The first of which is the rent-sharing problem in Iraq, which is exasperated by the blurred articles in the Iraqi constitution referring to who uh, has control over energy resources in the region. So it says, similar, similarly, uh, our bill takes unilateral steps and makes agreements with international companies at the expense of the Iraqi government, which disturbs Maliki. See, that's what I was talking about. They're making deals. Then they would, uh, the central government didn't like that. Moreover, the undecided status of Kirkuk in Iraq makes the problem more common because of having, I think they meant to say, vast oil and gas reserves. Then Iraq tensions rise as Syria crisis deepens. The crisis in Syria is threatening to rupture Iraq's precarious sectarian divide, which some say might reignite into civil war. They just had something recently where like almost 100 people got injured from bombs or killed. Too. So, wedged between Syria's greatest ally, Iran, and the greatest foe, Turkey, with its own volatile ethnic makeup, oil, riches, and fresh out of years of civil strife, Iraq is desperately clinging to a neutrality on the Syrian crisis. Fighters from across Iraq's Sunni, Shiite, Kurd communities have crossed from Iraq into Syria to assist their compatriots. Oh, see, uh, uh, Islamists or compatriots or Sunni fighters. From Iraq's Ambar province that are basically, what, uh, they're going in there with money, men, and weapons to f take down Assad to, carry, to help carry out the Brookings Institute report uh, and plan. The Syrian Kurds are being trained to fight alongside other Kurdish forces by Iraq's semi-autonomous northern government against the Free Army and Assad's forces. Then you have uh, Shiite fighters being encouraged uh, in northern Mosul and reportedly being sent from Iran and Iraq to Syria to defend Shiite shrines and fight alongside Assad's government. Then I found this article from McClatchy. Kurds say they'll stop Islamist rebels from moving along Syria's border with Turkey. A tense truce between the Syrian rebels and Kurdish militia held Tuesday in the city of Ras al Ain, fast against the border with Turkey. But neither uh, side hit its disdain for the other and both continued to hold prisoners in a standoff says here that uh, that they fell to the rebels almost two weeks ago, the city, the first rebel victory in the country's predominantly Kurdish northeast. At least five members of a Kurdish political party uh, were killed last week when they exchanged fire with the rebels, whom the Kurds asked to leave. Kurds make up about 10% of Syria's population. One of the Kurdish militia's commanders said the group would allow some rebel fighters to pass, but that members of the Islamist groups who have been at the forefront of the recent rebel victories would be kept back. He referred to them as Al-Qaeda. And then we shift to Yemen. Yemen offers South equal uh, representation in national dialogue meeting, so insists separatists will be given a good number of seats. Eager to give the event at least a veneer of legitimacy, Yemeni officials say they have reserved half of the 565 seats at a national dialogue meeting to different factions from South Yemen, including a number of separatist factions. No date has been set. Exactly what the meeting will entail is also vague. So the meeting is supposed to uh, talk about a new constitution being drafted, but it seems to be aimed at legitimizing the UN-backed plan to keep uh, Hadi in power going forward. But it goes on here and it says that um, they don't seem likely to be attracted by any offer of seats at uh, such a conference if it means abandoning their secessionist goals. Then next up we have what? Uh, Yemen's tattered reality after a fairy tale revolution. So a year on from the Arab Spring supposed to usher in a new era for Yemen. For most it is a perilous time with no clear direction as played by instability and lawless lawlessness allowing it to fall prey to further U.S. military expansion, which is what they're doing. The unrest was brought about by the Arab Spring and, of course, high food and gas prices, uh, but that, of course, can be manipulated by the global elites by just pushing the buttons and turning the knobs. It triggered numerous political transitions throughout the Middle East and North Africa in 2011, including Yemen of the Arabian Peninsula. So a year since the political transition, they continue to face food uh, insecurity, 
uh, impoverishment and the threat of violent extremism from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. As guns are everywhere. Yeah, actually, Yemen is up there with one of the most uh, militarized uh, states in the world. In the country's sparsely populated and oil-rich south, formerly known as the Democratic People's Republic of Yemen, citizens of the once communist state advocate separatism and independence from the unified Yemen. It says the United States has backed the new regime or administration and continues to implement a program of drone strikes in Yemen's rural areas despite reports of substantial civilian casualties. And here's some pictures of what's going on there. A little picture of the ex-leader Salih hanging uh, kind of crooked like and uh, here's some guys just hanging out uh, some more busted up buildings kind of looks like Syria or Libya or other places it says former president Salih remains a revered figure among many of the poor and merchant classes so yeah check that out business is doing well Yemen's derelict ministry of industry and trade in ruins following the Arab Spring Something that's interesting, I'm just learning now, the sale of cot, an amphetamine-like stimulant and appetite suppressant, is the backbone of Yemen's economy. Users often chew leaves until their cheeks become inflamed. The U.S. buys Yemen a fleet of spy planes for growing shadow war. I've covered this in the last couple of years, actually since I started GGN back in, what, 2009, 2010, about how the U.S. Uh, basically, uh, you know, is the backbone of Yemen. It's kind of interesting though, I didn't, never really thought about it until now that the U.S. had a lot of money invested in Yemen as far as security and all that prior to the Arab Spring and now they're just funneling more and more and more in there. So it says it's not enough for Yemen skies to fill up uh, with armed with drones. Now the Pentagon wants to buy its Yemeni ally small piloted spy planes. So it's a sign that the U.S. is upgrading its hardware. It gives the Yemen military and digging in for a long shadow war. The shadow war means that they're not, you're not going to see it on Fox News every day. Breaking news. Uh, some poor bastard in Yemen just had his brains and his body blown to pieces in the name of fighting the war on terror. Now, see, it's a shadow war. You're not going to hear about that every day. All the drone strikes in Somalia, too, or Pakistan. Fam uh, family or familia, uh, neighbors of Yemeni killed by U.S. drone wonder why he wasn't taken alive. So this guy is standing next to a building uh, pockmarked by damage from the drone strike that killed his brother, who's targeted for his alleged ties to Al-Qaeda. So this Amar was just one of more than 50 American airstrikes believed to have taken place in Yemen so far this year. Unlike the usual post-strike conjecture, however, this one has unleashed a flurry of speculation about why a well-known figure in his town was targeted in such a violent, anonymous way. It goes on here and it says that uh, it's nearly inconceivable to imagine that uh, he could not have been taken into custody, a Yemeni uh, political analyst says. The residents say that he could have been captured easily. The CIA in the U.S., whose drone launched the missile that killed, uh, declined to comment. Here's U.S. drones in Yemen. The number of U.S. drone strikes in Yemen has spiked in 2012. A look at the trend from 2009 to uh, 2010, five drone strikes. 2011, 17 drone strikes. In 2012, 54 drone strikes. So the Pentagon's on uh, uh, damage control saying a human will always decide when a robot kills you. So that should help you sleep better at night as uh, the ex recent explosion in Indianapolis is uh, still not giving us much uh, information on that. So the Pentagon wants to make perfectly clear that every time one of its flying robots releases a lethal payload, it's a result of a decision made by an accountable human being in an, a lawful chain of command. So it's just like everything else. Damn it, I don't want Chinese fluoride. I want American fluoride. Damn it, if I'm going to get killed by a drone strike, I want it to be done by a human and not a robot. Saudi diplomat shot dead in Yemen capital of Sana says here him and his bodyguard have been shot dead in the capital. They opened fire in the diplomat's car, causing it to flip over. The gunmen were said to have been dressed as members of the security ser uh, services. Sounds like a professional hit job to me. Next... Next up, we have Ethiopia to help Somalia to create federal system of government. So it sounds nice, right? Says that Somalia says currently it is in the process of empowering its citizens to understand federalism and to appreciate it. So I don't know how you guys are appreciating and loving federalism here in the United States. But it goes on here and it says it's moving from an independent state to a federal one and is in the process of empowering its citizens to understand federalism. Let's not forget, uh, 
CIA takes over as Ethiopian regime crumbles. Let's not also forget that this Zenawa actually died of suspicious uh, circumstances recently. The Ethiopian Prime Minister, who is now dead, is turning more and more to the CIA for making his government's critical decisions as the foundation of his regime crumbles. Blackwater founder Eric Prince seeks Asian investors for South Sudan Defense Project. The former leading U.S. Uh, defense contractor has selected South Sudan as his next market. He sees it as part of an emerging market in Africa, saying, We are the search radar for the Asian investors in Africa. It is the most unexplored part of the world, and I think China has seen a lot of promise in Africa. And we've been hearing about the Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo recently, too, along the M23 rebels. But this is the title it should be, uh, 24 Trillion Mineral Wealth, Corporations vs. the M23 Rebels. It says here they produce the biggest producers of tin and tungsten. Tungsten is what's been used in those fake gold bars that have been found. About half the world's cobalt output and about 3% of the world's copper gold, which is used in consumer electronics like Afghanistan with those uh, types of minerals and that. So we're talking about Somalia and Ethiopia. Russia may deploy reconnaissance, spy planes, and Djibouti. So this is uh, Camp Lemonier, ex-former uh, French base, where the CIA drone strikes actually strike and, uh, and lift off and take off uh, to strike Somalia. The Queen of England toasts the Emir of Kuwait as state, at state banquet. Sorry, The Queen has welcomed the Emir for a three-day visit at the banquet. So it's interesting, said in a speech dinner, the Queen paid tribute to Kuwait's promotion of vibrant democracy. And there's... Uh, Mr. Cameron. Fortune 500 awards Tunisian President Chatham House Prize. So the corporate financier think tank Chatham House showers Tunisia's president with uh, accolades and praise. They announced the prize earlier this week, the Chatham House Prize for Tunisia 2012. The Tunisian president uh, has ensured that the country remains at the forefront of the new democratic wave in the Middle East and North Africa. Yeah, when they use, when they use the word democratic or democracy, that's Basically, the, uh, uh, that country losing its sovereignty, uh, imposing a central bank, uh, being a slave to the IMF and the Rothschilds and all them. So he accepted the award in person, presented by the Duke of York in London. Speaking of the IMF, one of the several nominees also included Christian Lagarde of the IMF. Go figure, the previous recipients included U.S.-backed democracy icon uh, Su Kai of Myanmar, where there's a eth uh, ethnic cleansing going on of uh, Muslims. Nuclear Christmas, false flag in America to blame on Iran. So this is uh, by Gordon Duff of the Veterans Today, I think. There are strong confirmations that one or more nuclear weapons known to have been stolen but kept from the public to prevent panic may well have been deployed in American cities by extremist elements with probable ties to a foreign intelligence agency. Now, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? One of my favorite shows. The scenario was the basis of the TV show Jericho. Uh, however, this time there are real culprits and mo real motivations to both overthrow the government of the U.S. and naming of Iran as a scapegoat. The plot has been tracked to groups within the Pentagon, several government agencies, and wealthy and powerful extremist backers of Natiano of Israel, and in particular the Gulf Cartel, the Gulf states of Qatar and that, operating from Mexico, that's penetrated nearly all levels of government, law enforcement, and military across the country. Using surprisingly direct language, President Obama has officially confirmed this conspiracy six days ago on his official website, issuing a warning about government insiders who were planning to pl uh, violent acts against the government and the nation. Go in there and check out the rest. Keep moving. Is Pakistan's paranoia pushing it into nuclear war with India? Well, Pakistan just recently test-fired a nuclear-capable missile. And I believe India just uh, launched its first uh, aircraft carrier warship recently. America planned to nuke the moon in the 50s. It was a plot as a show of strength to intimidate uh, Russia at the height of the Cold War. The U.S. Senate is set to vote whether a law to penalize human rights violators will only be applied to Russia or to all countries around the world, We're talking about the Magnitsky Act. This is a human rights tool that we have available to advance against all international human rights abusers, says a congressman from Maryland, which would freeze American bank accounts and deny U.S. visas to corrupt Russian officials and human rights violators. Russia responded by saying, considering very crude violations of human rights in the United States itself, including practical legalization of torture and indefinite holding of inmates without trial, special CIA prisons, the U.S. has no moral right to preach or moralize to other countries. 
Lavrov of Russia says West is looking to reanimate Russia's adversary image. Says the political elites of Western countries are failing to adjust to the present realities. FedEx driver is suing after he says he was fired for having a Russian accent. And Cossack vigilantes start patrolling Moscow streets. And Ukraine has been crushed in a fake gas deal. So no independence. Thank you.